All right, this is part two of the uh, video. Uh, videos on um, what it means for a sequence of real numbers to converge to a given real number L. So what I want to remind you of is from the previous video, what was that definition in symbols for? What does it mean for a sequence XN to converge to L? So in symbols, what we said is that would mean for all positive numbers epsilon, there exists a natural number where again, this n probably depends on this epsilon, such that for all little n larger than or equal to capital N that you found, you should have that every single term of that high enough index, the distance between every term and that number L should be smaller than epsilon. So that again, eventually, all the points in your sequence are within this number epsilon of L. And if no such number uh, L exists, we'll just say that the sequence XN diverges. What I want to do is just to kind of parse out what does this absolute value stuff mean again? Remember we're saying that's the distance between a point in your sequence, Xn, and L. We're saying that's less than epsilon. So from college algebra, one way you could rewrite that, it's equivalent to say that Xn minus L is between minus epsilon and epsilon. Well, that's equivalent to saying that Xn is between L minus epsilon and L plus epsilon, right? If I just add this L to both sides of this inequality. And then the last thing I want to remind you of is that's the same thing saying that Xn is a point that's inside what we called an epsilon neighborhood of L. And just to remind you what that was, that's defined to be the set of all real numbers whose distance from L is less than epsilon. What I wanted to do is just draw you a picture and a one-dimensional picture of what's going on here to say that a sequence converges to L. So in the previous video, I drew you like a two-dimensional picture with some graphs and stuff. I'm trying to give you the one-dimensional analog of what's going on here. So if you've got a natural, uh, uh, sorry, if you've got an L, again, for any yellow number epsilon that I pick, I should be able to put this little window around L such that the following thing happens. You know, maybe in the beginning I plot my points, maybe x1 is out here and x2 is out here, but I'm saying that eventually I should be far enough out of my sequence so that xn and every single point after xn lands inside of that yellow window. So for any yellow window you put around L, eventually all your green points need to be inside of there. Eventually. Okay, so I'm going to erase some of that stuff for now. And what I want to do is focus on how do you use that definition to prove that a sequence xn has limit L? So prove limit of one over n is equal to zero. And by the way, just to remind you, we usually omit writing n goes to infinity here because it's understood that this is a sequence, therefore I care about what happens as n, a natural number, gets large. What happens is these numbers get large. So I want to prove that this happens. And when it says prove that, I want to use this definition and symbols up here to do such a thing. So what we want to get used to is how do we use this clunky definition? Or it seems clunky. I mean, it's actually a beautiful thing, but it seems clunky. So just so we're all used to how this happens, don't jump right in. Do some scratch work or make a plan first. So the plan, given epsilon greater than zero, we're supposed to show that there exists a natural number n such that for all little n larger than or equal to capital N, we should have one over n minus zero as less than epsilon. In other words, I should have the distance between points in my sequence, a point in my sequence in particular, and zero is less than epsilon. And what you'll typically do is you'll actually start here and try, try to get a relationship between n and epsilon. So try to get a relationship between those two. And so what we'll start doing is, well, I'll simplify this absolute value here. That's just one over n. I don't need the absolute values anymore. And that's less than epsilon. Try to solve that for n if you can. Well, that says that n is larger than one over epsilon. And so what should we do? Well, once we've solved that for n, we're almost kind of done if I could just have something with epsilon left on the other side. So why don't we let capital N just be the first natural number that's larger than one over epsilon? Let's see what happens then. So let's start our formal, our little formal proofs. So this is more or less how your proof should go. So let epsilon be larger than zero and choose capital N so that capital N is larger than the reciprocal of epsilon. Well then for every single natural number little n larger than that capital N, we should have the following, one over n minus zero, which is just one over n, that's pretty magical, right? But that's less than or equal to one over capital N. So being comfortable with something like, you know, I said that little n's bigger than capital N, so therefore this denominator is larger than this one. That's why the reciprocal of one over capital N should be larger. I hope that, that makes sense. The denominator more towards the right, right here, that thing's got a smaller denominator, so it's a bigger fraction. 
And so that is, again, by hypothesis here, if n is larger than 1 over epsilon, 1 over n is less than epsilon, and that's what I'm going for. So we were just able to ensure that as long as you're this far out in your sequence, then the distance between your sequence and 0 is definitely smaller than epsilon. And that would work for any epsilon that you plugged in. It's pretty magic. So that was a pretty easy one. Let's do one that's slightly more complicated. So let's try to prove, again, using the definition of a, what it means for a sequence to converge, that 5n minus 2 over 3n plus 1, that, that limit is equal to 5 thirds. So start with your scratch work. Start with your plan first. So what are you going for? So given epsilon, we're supposed to find some natural number, capital N, so that for all n bigger than or equal to that, we should have 5n minus 3 over 3n plus 1 minus 5 thirds is less than epsilon. Again, point in my sequence, minus the supposed limit, should be less than epsilon eventually. So how do I find the indices n where that'll happen? So what we'll do is we'll start there again. Try to relate, get a relationship between n and epsilon from that if we can. So let's do that. So when I write that side down, what immediately jumps out to me is I should try to get a common denominator and simplify some stuff. And assuming that I do on my algebra right here, I think you get minus 14 in the top and then divided by 3 times 3n plus 1. Now in the next step, we're going to simplify some more a little bit. We're going to use some common sense. If I take the absolute value, well, I could just get rid of the negative on the 14. I'm going to do that in the next step. But what I also claim is that that should be less than or equal to 14 over n. So being able to say, look at these now, look at these denominators, this denominator right there, that's bigger than this denominator, right? So therefore, this whole fraction is less than or equal to this whole fraction. So being able to make those kind of jumps is very important in this class. It's kind of simple, but sometimes maybe we're not used to thinking that way. Why is that good? Why is that good? What do I want? Remember, I wanted to say this was less than epsilon for some n, right? Well, I get that that's less than epsilon if I can make this less than epsilon. And so why don't I try to make 14 over n less than epsilon? That's a lot easier than trying to make this so less than epsilon. And if I do that, if I, if I specify that 14 over n should be less than epsilon, that gives me an idea of how big n should be. I should make sure that n is bigger than 14 divided by epsilon. So what we'll do is we'll let capital N be the first natural number that's larger than 14 over epsilon. And so again, maybe some textbooks might call this k of epsilon. And again, the point I'm trying to emphasize is that n definitely depends on what epsilon that you have. But I think now we're ready to start our formal proof. And what we kind of do again is we're going to work backwards a little bit. So let epsilon be bigger than zero. And choose capital N to be the first natural number such that n is larger than 14 divided by this epsilon. And for every single index little n larger than or equal to capital N, we should have the following. The absolute value of these things, again, a point in my sequence, the nth term of my sequence, minus 5 thirds. I did all that simplification earlier. I know that that's minus 14 over 3 times 3n plus 1. I'm going to apply my same logic that, well, that's less than or equal to 14 over n. That itself is less than 14 over capital N, again, because little n's larger than capital N. Therefore, this fraction with the larger denominator is less than or equal to this fraction with the smaller denominator. And then why is that fantastic? Because if n was larger than 14 over epsilon, Think about what would happen if you plug that in here, right? Or in other words, think about how do those relate to each other. I know that this should be less than epsilon. And that is the end of that part, right? We just successfully proved that, yes, this limit is equal to 5 thirds because we we're eventually able to say, we're able to say that eventually all these terms in my sequence, the distance from that to 5 thirds is smaller than that number epsilon.